But I say, walk by the Spirit and do not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For those are opposed to each other to prevent you from doing what you would, but if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are plain fornication, impurity, licentiousness, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, anger, selfishness, dissension, party spirit, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and the like. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law, and those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us walk by the Spirit. Let us have no self-conceit, no provoking of one another, no envy of one another. The word of the Lord. Thanks. Good morning, all. I do have to uh, do one clarification. In, uh, in the list that Julie read, so she doesn't know, I have never served as a deacon. I'm sorry to say. But <laughs> all the rest of it I've done, yes. <laughs> uh, well, this sermon today is based on something that happened to me about 45 or 50 years ago when uh, we were attending the Presbyterian Church in Ephrata, Washington, and they asked, the youth group came and said, we're going to put on this play, and since you're a music teacher, we'd like you to be the part of the music man. And the thing was called The Music Machine, and it was based on Galatians, on the fruits of the Spirit, and when Susie asked me if I would do this and, and what I would talk on, I told her, well, I think I want to talk on the fruits of the Spirit, because that's basically about all I know. And uh, so hopefully it will help. But first, will you join me in prayer? Gracious God, as we come together to celebrate your word and to fulfill the mission of Christ, please be with us. Give us the words and the understanding that we can glorify you. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh. Well, this thing, this guy called Paul, He's actually called Saul at one time, and then he was a Jew. He was a real Jew. He was a Jew's Jew. He had been taught by all of the greatest teachers. He had been a harsh critic of this new sect of uh, renegade Jews, he called them. He even held the coats of those who were out there stoning Stephen, if you remember the story of Stephen, was very devout and was praising Jesus and praising Christ, and they stoned him for it. And Paul was standing there holding the coat saying, go, boys, go. Well, <laughs> there was a time that, okay, it hit him. He was going up to Damascus to grab a bunch of another of these <clears throat> renegade Jews to haul them down to Jerusalem to try them and throw them in prison. And something happened to him. He met Jesus. Well, after that, he spent some time as uh, a blind man and, uh, and then was raised and was taught and went out to the wilderness and spent some time in the wilderness to reflect on this new information he'd been given by this Jesus. And then he went back to Jerusalem and spent time with Peter <clears throat> and uh, studied with Peter and James, the brother of Jesus. But then, knowing that the, the original apostle, the original disciples of Christ were actually taking care of all of the people in, in, uh, in Judea and the surrounding areas, Paul decided that, well, <clears throat> Maybe I need to go to the Gentiles. And so he went to Asia. Now, Galatia was the name of an area that is now in Turkey, and, uh, and it's still there, and you can go and find a few Christians there, but mostly you're going to find uh, people of another religious sect. 
But he began teaching. He, he's actually, <clears throat> he was actually teaching the local Jews, and many did not accept what he had to say. I mean, what are you talking about? You're a Jew. You're not supposed to be talking about this new message. Well, okay, if we're saved by this spirit, what about, uh, what about circumcision? What about all the law we have to follow, the hand washing and all of these uh, food things? He says, you don't need those. And they said, oh, you're full of beans. And they ran him out of the synagogue. Well, where do you go from there? Well, he did find, of course, public places. There are, we can still find public places all over here and have a church if we want. And uh, he went to homes. Many of the times we hear him preaching in the home of somebody, this and that. But his message was always simple. <clears throat> Believe in the saving grace of Jesus. Accept a simple baptism and give up the desire to be like everyone else. And then you will be saved. There's no need to become a Jew. Jesus is all we need to save us. And that's where the idea of being a Christian comes from. Jesus, the Christ, is what we need. He convinced a lot of people. I mean, they, they, the Galatian church was one of the larger ones in the, in the uh, Asian area at that time, and they were spreading the word like mad, and he felt really good about it. So <clears throat> after having a long trip, now we don't know which trip he did this on, one or two, but when he got back, he decided to go back to Jerusalem and do some resting and talk to the elders and explain what he'd been doing and all of that. So he was waiting in his home and got word from uh, a letter that somebody sent him saying, hey, uh, there's a bunch of uh, Jewish people up here telling these Gentiles that they have to change and they have to take up all the Jewish rules. And he got mad. He was not happy. He got word that was telling him, you were not entirely saved, so he had to do something. And, of course, a trip was expensive and long and all that. So he wrote a book, or actually wrote a letter, and we now call it a book. It's the book of Galatians. In this letter, he, of course, listed his qualifications. He said, I was a Jew. I was the ultimate Jew. I did all of this. I followed all these laws, and I did everything I had. So I am the perfect Jew. So to all of you Jewish people up there, you can't do anything any better than I did. And then he says, but I also met Christ. And therefore, at that point, being a Jew doesn't count anymore. It was Lissa's authority gained through the revelation and the approval from the church in Jerusalem because he had already gone and talked to Peter and James and all of the elders, and they said, yes, you are a true Christian. You can go out and spread the word. So then he goes on to state the freedom of being a disciple of Christ and what it is, the benefits of Christianity. He then began chapter 5 declaring that it was for freedom that Christ died. It was for freedom, our freedom. We need no longer be slaves to earthly things. We don't need to go back to being slavery of doing what men want us to do. Because this type of freedom means that we do not have to eat special foods. We don't have to act certain ways, bow down to the east six times a day. We don't have to genuflect when we talk, walk up to the front. We're free in Christ. The world hasn't changed much since that time, though, because there are still people who think, well, if you're going to be a Jew, uh, Christian, you've got to be a Jew first. Well, sorry. They think someone who agrees, and then there are those, oh, yes, too many, of, too many of the people in today's world think that being a Christian means certain things. Too many people in our country, they think they need to be following the brand of Christianity, the one that anoints the government as their brand of Christianity. Now, <laughs> I promised Bruce I was going to talk about this, that just because you are a Christian does not mean that you have to support certain public officials because Christianity is free from that. There are people in parts of our country who say, oh, no, you're not a Christian if you don't agree with this man. Well, I'm sorry. I'm a Christian. I disagree with this man. 
They think someone who agrees with them should only be our, the only should be our leader. But I urge you not to follow that misguided logic because Paul said, this is a false belief. In this book, Paul contrasts the freedom of Jesus with the condemnation of the flesh. Now, the flesh is basically humanity. After the fall, Satan got us and he owns us. And if we live in humanity, we're living in Satan. It means immorality. Well, let's see, what's immoral? <laughs> I think we can all think of something that's immoral. Impurity, sensuality, idolatry. Now, that's a hard one for all of us to think about because we don't think of idolatry as, as that. But there are people in this country who believe that the mightiest thing there is is the government or the dollar or this or that. And that's idolatry. There are outbursts of anger. Well, it's anger directed at a general cause, not necessarily anger at you as a person, but general anger. There are disputes. Have we seen some disputes lately? There are factions. <laughs> factions, okay. Uh, carousing and things like that. I'm sure you might know someone uh, maybe on the national stage that resembles a carouser and a person of poor reputation. But his mission, message is from the flesh, not from the spirit. Many people claiming to be Christians are following him and trying to get us to join them. But we don't need someone like that. We who follow the spirit already know the way to in heaven and it does not go through the ballot box. There are benefits of rejecting worldly pursuits, of course, and they were listed. Paul called them the fruits of the spirits. Love. Now, this is the part in that play. I had to remember this. And I don't anymore. <laughs> it's been 45 or 50 years, and I do not have them all memorized. But <clears throat> they are. Love. Joy. Peace. Patience. Kindness goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and the hardest one for me, self-control. Paul says there's no law against them. But that's not what I see on my TV every day. I don't see the, the, the spirit. But what do they actually mean? Well, love. What is love? It's this all-encompassing, as many of us have learned in our past, the agape love, the love of God. Love for one another. The desire to be of service to others, helping with what we can give. Being there to lend a hand and some guidance when needed. And we do that when we join together today in worship, in Bible studies, in the SOS dinner. We are, we are spreading love then. Uh, helping with children's activities in the church. I mean, when, when we used to have a vacation Bible school, I have to tell you, you could see love running around here with all the little kids running around having a good time. And uh, we, we enjoyed volunteering for that. But that's love. And what is joy? Well, joy is a well-being, a feeling of wellness that is given by the Spirit. We can manifest this joy when we worship and commune with others, as we're doing here, and generally having fun doing church. I mean, we can do church like we did a few weeks ago, even in a, in a state park. And uh, so that is joy. Peace, <clears throat> a tranquility in your heart. It's hard sometimes to find ourselves at peace because we have, well, I got to take care of that job. Oh, dear, I got that person to worry about. Oh, I got to go out and mow the lawn. I've got to fill gas in the car. I got to go shopping. No feeling good about ourselves and feeling the feeling we get when we help others. That's the peace from the spirit, being one with the spirit. Patience, well, yeah. Forgiving in nature, you know, it's hard to forgive, especially if uh, someone says something at you and <gasps> it's hard to forgive. I've gotten better at it as I've gotten older, I have to admit. In, uh, in another 10 or 15 years, if I make it there, I will probably learn how to really forgive. But it's also not being judgmental of others. I try not to judge anyone anymore. I mean, I try not to say, but there's sometimes it's hard. 
It does not mean that we ignore evil intentions. No, we still have to stand up and point out the evil that is being presented. We can still stand up to bullies and those who are trying to drag us down into worldly pursuits. Those are things that we have to worry about for peace and for patience. But kindness is, well, it's kind of related to goodness. In Greek, the same word can be used for kindness and for goodness. Or, excuse me, another word might be mellowness, an openness of character for scribing or growth. So, I don't mean the kind of mellow that we used to study in the 60s, but uh, the kind of mellow where you accept, okay, God, I can do this. Fidelity. <laughs> Fidelity is an old-fashioned word for sticking to it, sticking with them, being a, your friend. It's a, more of an idea of being reliable, of being trustworthy, of keeping our word and doing right. Not accepting the fleshly evils, but fidelity, being the right kind of person. Gentleness. Now, <laughs> when I was a young man, gentleness didn't occur to me. And uh, I, was, I was a bull in the china closet quite often. But now gentleness has uh, come on because I can't physically do a lot of the things I used to do. And uh, it's getting harder and harder every day. Like yesterday. <laughs> I walked for two and a half hours yesterday. And I can tell it this morning. But gentleness is being open to the will of God. Not too proud to learn from others. Being considerate. And it might be the most important fruit. Because this leads to great conversations, great experiences, and great gatherings among Christians. It allows us to get things done. Self-control. Well, I think we all know what self-control means. Mastering our basic desires and desiring to be a servant of God. That is the self-control that is of the Spirit. Now, enjoying the fruits of the Spirit and rejecting the sins of the flesh gives us a much more peaceful life. Paul says, if we belong to the Spirit, we need to walk by the Spirit. We need to work together in the Spirit and we don't boast about what we did. See, it might be wonderful, you can come out and you do all kinds of wonderful things, but if you boast about it, you're kind of ruining the whole thing. Do the job, walk away, and let others say, oh, wasn't that a wonderful job, but don't talk about it. We have nothing to boast about. All the work that we have to do for salvation was done by Jesus. There's nothing we can do to save ourselves. Nothing at all. We have to just accept Jesus' crucifixion as our own and live a better life. Well, the question can be asked, how do we live a better life? Well, I think it means sharing what God has given us. We have a wonderful congregation. It's small today, but if you think about all the people who are associated with us, it is a pretty good-sized congregation. It's full of good people. It's full of some good, great, great leadership. We have wonderful music. We have a, a wonderful pastor. I think our, uh, our session is doing okay. We, there are some things we're gonna work on, I'm sure. But we have good leadership. Our little church on the hill is a sanctuary from the evils of the world. We offer a lot to the world. We offer home for a second church. We offer home for those people trying to get rid of their addictions to narcotics. We offer a home to a group of actors who enjoy putting on performances, everybody. And come this fall, we're gonna be giving a home to a school once a week. We'll have a homeschool meeting here and uh, instructing their children. And it's our little church on the hill. We are, we are doing a pretty good job. We don't need to follow the crowd. And as spiritual believers, we have all we need to be beacons of hope to our city, our country, and our world. We are a beacon of hope on this little hill here. Now, think about it. I'm standing here, and I'm an old man, and I'm saying all of this stuff, and how am I a beacon? Well, 
If I help one person somewhere along the line, I've done something for Christ, and that's the beacon that we need to be. So think about helping. Each year, we need to reassess how we spread the message. We have a new opening every January. We start a new group, a new opening of uh, another year. And keeping our doors open is one way we can keep spreading the message. It's getting harder and harder as the financial chairman, I can tell you. It's getting tight, and you'll be hearing stories coming up in the next few months about how we need to uh, tighten our belt and uh, do a better job of, of our resources, but you're going to hear that later. We're going to need help with budgeting. I've already asked a couple of people, and I'm going to ask a few more if you would be willing to serve on a, uh, on a committee for uh, stewardship. And uh, the importance of that is thinking about how we can convince the people that love our church to continue supporting our church. If I haven't asked you yet, well, that's just because I haven't gotten to you yet. But uh, if you want to stop and see me on the way out this morning, please feel free and let me know if you'd be willing to serve on a committee for stewardship. But money's not the only way we can help our church. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> uh, Julie did a wonderful job this morning helping out. And we always need people to do, to do uh, the liturgist. Don't be afraid. I mean, it's, it's not hard. You stand here, and it's all right there in the book, and you just basically read it. Right, Julie? Yeah. I did it last week, and, uh, and we've had some very fine liturgists come through here. Edie is a wonderful one. I really enjoy having her. And Chuck, too. Chuck is a wonderful liturgist, so I can look around. There are a lot of the others there. I think you can come up, and you could do it just as well or better than I can. We need help on the third Saturday every month. Brian Henderson would love to have you come and join him out working on the, on the trees and the flowers and the grass and, and all of that kind of stuff. Or if you need, like I said last week, if you need some bamboo, we still have a bunch of it laying down there that we, can, <laughs> we gotta figure out how to get, get rid of. Or if you can take it home and you need it, come and take it. Darren Gemmer is a, is a wonderful follower of our church and a, a good member, and he is in helping with the youth. And there are times I'm sure Darren would enjoy help with youth. So if you ever hear a, a request from Darren, think about it. Well, can I help with young people? Young people are fun, by the way. I know. I spent 30 years working with young people, junior high age kids, and they're fun. They're just they might, yeah, some people say they're a pain, but I found them to be extremely fun, and they're easy, to, they're easy to, to tease. Back there, Mike, Karen, Rick, and usually me too, we can always use more help. Somebody will learn how to run these certain things so that we can have sound, we can have pictures, we can have uh, a video go out to the homes, to all you wonderful people out there. And it's not hard, it just takes some time. It takes an hour, an hour or so of your Sunday morning to come and help. <clears throat> the nursery team always needs help. I mean, when, when you got a, a one person trying to handle a bunch of kids, yeah, on a day when there's a lot of kids in there, they can always use some help. Even picking up some trash as we walk by. <laughs> now, I got to commend Woody today. Woody did a wonderful job. We looked after the, after the play last night, we looked around and there was, you would have seen it had you looked. You can't see a mess up here, can you? But Woody took care of it this morning. He came in with the little thing and he swept it all up and took it all out of here. And then he, then he sat down and did some beautiful music. Thank you. When we joined the church, one of the things that we pledged to do, we promised to support it with our gifts, our presence, and our service. Now is the time to decide how much we want to help it. I know the Spirit's on our side. All we need to do is listen and follow. I hope the Spirit falls on each and every one of you. May God bless you. Amen.